So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of infectious arthritis as a whole. Um, and we're going to do this in sort of a nice case-based kind of strategy. So our first case, we have a 78-year-old female. She has AFib. And I'm sorry, I use this case a lot. So I'm sorry if you guys have heard it before. But she's admitted to the hospital with a right lower lobe pneumonia. Um, so she gets, you know, she gets admitted, she gets antibiotics, um, she starts feeling better, but on hospital day two, she develops sort of the acute onset of left wrist pain and swelling. She's never had anything like this before, um, but it's very severe. Um, her temperature is 37.9, so kind of borderline fever. Her blood pressure is okay, uh, oxygen saturation is okay. She has a little bit of a white count, 11.8. And she has a cranium of 1.8. Oh, that's kind of her baseline. And you do an exam and you see this is her left wrist. So I think, I think a couple of things to point out about this that I think are important for residents to know. I think number one is that, um, can you guys see the pointer? Yeah. So number one is that um, it's really important, especially when you're starting out, to compare joints to the opposite side because you'll definitely pick up things that become very obvious when you see them. So I think all of us have kind of seen this type of hand at someone in the hospital here just from like volume overload or a DVT or something like that. But when you kind of compare this to the opposite side, it becomes very obvious that it's abnormal. The second thing to remember is if someone has wrist inflammation, um, so if you have pain in the radiocarpal joint here, inflammation here, that's gonna cause, the wrist is sort of like a choke point, right? So that's gonna cause backup of swelling along the entire dorsal aspect of the hand. So even though the, the inflammation is here, you're kind of get, gonna get swelling very much distal to that. So this is really what a wrist effusion will, will look like. All right, so what's our differential for, um, for this patient? So uh, let's see, bless five, I can see you guys, although you're, you're really masked up there. Pseudo gout. Okay, so we got pseudo gout. What else? This is a talk on infectious arthritis. Septic arthritis. Okay, good. Anything else? Reactive arthritis from a previous infection. So why is it, you mean reactive arthritis from her current pneumonia? Uh, from like a previous infection, like concurrently. Yeah, why is it probably not reactive arthritis? But I like where your head's at. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. So, so reactive arthritis doesn't present sort of like in sort of this thunderclap presentation like she's presenting with, right? It's much more of a subacute, right? So I think you guys are right. I mean, our differential for sort of you have the acute onset of like joint inflammation. Your differential is actually quite small. Right, your differential is a crystal arthropathy. You guys have noted a septic arthropathy, right? So septic arthritis, or you know, if you could have, have like a hematoma or something like that. Like, let's say that the um, you know she fell or something. So, what is um, uh, what's sort of the next kind of? Uh, uh, why did you guys at uh, who was that plus five? Why did you guys say say um, pseudo gout? Like, why did that come out first? Uh, just kind of commenting, you, you kind of let us, but basically the timing seems pretty acute in nature, monoarticular. Um, those were kind of the first things that came to mind. Why not gout? Um, maybe you would expect the classic presentation in the great toe or a joint that's more commonly involved, um, although I, I have seen it in the wrist like once or twice before. Yeah, no, you're 100% right. So gout can absolutely affect the wrist, but it almost never starts in the wrist, right? So it'd be very atypical to have a, a, your first attack of gout in the wrist. In contrast, right, pseudogout almost always starts in either the wrist or the knee. So uh, this is a very good story for pseudogout. Why not... Um, Bless five, is this a septic arthritis? Um, usually folks are pretty sick with septic joints. You did give us like a low grade 37.9 and a borderline leukocytosis, but if you had given me a 39 and a hypotension, I would have been very much more impressed. Okay, so what, what percentage of people with septic arthritis have a fever? I don't know off the top of my head. So it's, it's actually only about 50%. So I think the, um, so I, the, the teaching point that I wanna make here is that you really can't differentiate a septic arthritis from like an acute crystal arthropathy just based on peripheral signs alone. 
So both septic and crystal arthropathies can give you a white count. They both can give you a fever. They certainly both will give you sky high inflammatory markers, right? So there's no point in sending a CRP in this person because it's going to be through the roof. Um, so there's really no peripheral signs that can really help differentiate them that well. Um, I think in her, right, it would be, it, it would, it would sort of, uh, you know, if she comes in and she's getting antibiotics already for her pneumonia, it seems to strain credulity that she suddenly now has, and she's getting better from that point, that she suddenly now has a septic arthritis in some other, like a, a new infection, right, as opposed to a crystal arthropathy, which often will occur in the setting of a, a, an another, another illness. So I think you're right. I mean, I think that's why uh, I think the picture, the point is, is that the picture is more consistent with a crystal arthropathy, but there's really, you can't really differentiate those two just based on fever, white count, inflammatory markers, pain, right? Um, so what do you have to do with this patient? Tap them. Exactly, right? So you have to do an aspiration. So I always tell people, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but if you ever have an answer on the mix up or the boards and it has anything to do with rheumatology, if the answer to one of the answer choices is aspiration, that is the correct answer, right? Because there's really no other diagnostic test we have, at least in room, that's as definitive, right? So if you had do an aspiration and you see gout crystals, the patient has gout. If you see I do an aspiration and it grows something from the culture, the patient has a septic arthritis. So there aren't there that many things where we do a test and it basically gives us the diagnosis. So an aspiration in this particular setting is quite crucial. What, um, who's over at VHC? You guys have a, have a screen thing? Do you guys have a camera? Yeah. Could they I do. Maybe sometimes you gotta, maybe have to turn it on. <laughs> All right, and what about two north? Do you guys have a camera? Sorry, our camera died and we got interrupted for a second. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is uh, this is an example. Of, uh, uh, this is an example of what we call chondrocalcinosis. So this X right here. So this is basically showing um, uh, evidence of calcium deposition in the menisci. So this is CPB deposition. The one thing I would say is don't get fooled. I would use this. Um, use this as uh, in the same way that I would use the presence of hyperuricemia and gout, meaning that high levels of uric acid can suggest gout, but it's certainly not diagnostic, right? Because the majority of people with high uric acid levels never get gout. In the same way, the majority of people who have evidence of chondrocalcinosis on their x-rays never get acute pseudogout or acute CPV arthropathy. So I would just say, don't be fooled by the presence or absence of chondrocalcinosis. Again, the really only definitive test here would be to do an aspiration in this particular case, right? And that's what we found in this particular patient, right? You can see that you have these sort of rhomboid-shaped uh, bifringin crystals uh, within the cell, right? Pseudogout crystals are a little bit hard to see. So sometimes if, a, if the story is really good and the cultures are negative, I will sort of assume it's pseudogout. In contrast, gout crystals are usually quite easy to see. So they usually you get this big needle shape that's kind of going through the cell like that. But these are often kind of small and they're actually often not biofringin. Biofringin just means if you use the, uh, they basically light up under the, the microscope. Um, but uh, so they can sometimes be difficult to, to see. All right, case number two. So we have a 55 year old male uh, with a history of diabetes. He's presented with acute left knee pain and swelling. So he also has a, a temp of 37.9. He's hypertensive, uh, a little bit tachycardic. And you'll notice that his labs are basically the same as the previous patient. So he's a little bit of a white count and a little bit of an elevated creatinine, although again, that's his baseline. So this again is what a knee effusion will look like on the left. Again, I just wanna note a, a couple things. Number one, again, comparing to the opposite side will tell you, I, I, I would argue that most of us, if we just saw this particular knee, would not realize there's fluid in it. In contrast, when we compare it to the other side, again, you can see that there's, there's, that it's different. Number two is that a knee effusion will layer proximally. So it will layer into the suprapatellar bursa. So the fluid will almost look like it's in the distal thigh. And the reason that's important is one, it's obviously important to recognize it, but two, if you wanna aspirate this, 
right? You don't need to try to slide your needle underneath the patella, right? You just need to put the needle in the side here to, um, to take the fluid out. And I always tell people like, this is something that we can do over Skype, right? It's not that hard. If you guys are like putting in your A lines and your, when your, uh, your central lines in the ICU, you can definitely do a knee aspiration. If you come in from the side like this, there's no blood vessels, there's no nerves, so you really can't hurt the patient. I mean, you could miss, right? But it's really a very, very safe, um, safe procedure. All right, so what's our differential for this case? Um, just in our interest, interest of time, again, the differential is the same, right? Again, acute monoarticular arthritis, right? Your differential is a crystal arthropathy, uh, infectious, right? Or some sort of traumatic kind of event. And the additional workup, again, the answer is aspiration. So again, this is how you do a knee aspiration. This is an ultrasound. You're looking at the femur here and the patella here. So this is the quadriceps tendon inserted into the um, proximal patella. See how um, ultrasound can't penetrate bone. So we don't know what's kind of going on here, but we see that there's fluid leaking out here. And again, layering into the suprapatellar space. So again, to do an e-aspiration, you see that this person is putting the needle far above, like above the patella to go in uh, from the side there. And it's, again, it's a very, very easy procedure to do that again, all of you guys, if you had exposure, could, could do it, no problem. So the left knee joint in this patient does show 87,000 white cells, 91% uh, of which are neutrophils. And the gram stain shows gram positive cocci in clusters, okay? So this was a, a, an article that, there, I don't know if JAMA really does this anymore, but they used to have this series called the Rational Clinical Examination. And they would talk about, you know, doing thing, different exam maneuvers to try to like palpate the spleen and what, what's the evidence behind it, et cetera. So this came out, I guess, almost about 15 years ago, but I think the important things to point out from this is that, again, the specificity for all these peripheral signs are basically le less, less valuable than uh, just flipping a coin. So again, you cannot use the presence or absence of really any of these signs to rule out septic arthritis, with the exception of maybe, you know, if they have normal inflammatory markers, it becomes quite distinctly unlikely. But again, if you have a high CRP, and this is why like no one should ever order a CRP in the hospital, someone comes in with a acute monarchical arthritis and the CRP is going to be high, right? You don't need the blood test to tell you that. And that does how it helps you in no way in terms of form, in terms of changing things on your differential. So again, the point of this is that the, um, the really only an aspiration can really distinguish between the causes of the acute monarchical arthritis. In contrast to the peripheral signs, a synovial fluid white blood cell count can help you a lot. So the higher the synovial fluid white blood cell count is, the more likely it's, be, it's likely to be a septic arthritis. That being said, we have all had patients with gout who have a synovial white blood cell count of 60, 70,000. So again, you still have to send it for culture and do um, uh, microscopy to look for the look for the crystals. So the um, septic arthritis, um, it it uh, exactly how often it is the cause of a monarticular arthritis depends a lot on the setting in which you study it, right? So if you study it in a rheumatology clinic, right, the prevalence is going to be low, whereas if you study it in you know a, a, an orthopedic clinic, the prevalence is going to be higher. Um, but in general, I would say in general, the most that I see is it's much, much less common than crystal arthropathies as a cause of a monoticular arthritis. But again, if you talk to, you know, Will Postma or something like that, he would say he might have a different, different opinion. The knee is the most common site, but really any site can be infected by uh, septic arthritis, including the pubic synthesis. So the, um, we think that it, it, in general, it spreads from the blood into the actual joint space. This number of 75% is kind of interesting because it actually comes from a, um, a study in the Northern Territory of, of Australia where people had a lot of like fish hook injuries and stuff like that. So they, they, a lot of their, their septic arthritis was actually more sort of traumatic, but in general, the vast majority of septic arthritis that I think we see here is from hematogenous spread. That being said, there are sort of two mysteries to it. Number one is the blood cultures are usually only positive about half the time. That depends on what bacteria you're looking at. So again, the point is, is you cannot use a negative blood culture to rule out septic arthritis. The other sort of mystery is that, you know, we see patients with bacteremia all the time, but it really leads to septic arthritis a relatively small percentage of the time. So it's unclear exactly why you know, person A gets septic arthritis and person B does not in both in the setting of bacteremia.
Centric arthritis is a destructive arthritis, right? So all the um, all these all our specialties have the sort of like time is, you know, XXX um, uh, 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 sort of phrase, right? So neurology has time is brain, you know, urology has time is testicle for like an acute torsion. For septic arthritis, really time is joint. So because it's a destructive arthritis, right? People can have essentially loss of the joint if it's something like staph within 48 to 72 hours. And the outcomes are very clear, they're much better, the quicker you administer antibiotics and the quicker that, that, that you're, that's intervened upon. So again, you have to be, this is, a, this is really a can't miss diagnosis because again, even delay of treatment by hours can be um, catastrophic for the patient um, uh, kind of in the long term. So this is just an example. This is a septic hip that was untreated. And I'm not sure exactly what the time course is on these, um, on, these uh, uh, on x-rays, but this is sort of the initial x-ray. You see here, you can sort of start to see more erosions here. And then finally, again, you basically see essentially joint space collapse and total loss. So again, if you have a septic arthritis, the point is, is that this is a very destructive process, right? And you know, up to a third to half of patients will have chronic joint damage after a single episode of septic arthritis. So again, it's very, very important that this is intervened uh, upon uh, quite quickly. The, by far the most common cause is staph aureus. Um, streptococci are actually a relatively common cause too, especially strep pneumonia. And importantly, you do not need to have a pneumonia to have a strep pneumonia septic arthritis. Um, Neisseria we'll talk about a little later and all these other ones are mostly in immunocompromised, um, immunocompromised hopes. Um, major, there are a couple uh, obvious risk factors. So many of the ones that you might think about, so extremes of age, so either the very young or very old, anybody who has you know, other risk factors for infection, so diabetes, HIV, alcohol abuse, drug use, dialysis. And then notably, um, patients with um, recent joint surgeries or rheumatoid arthritis are also at risk. So, Remember that anytime you have joint damage, right, that's a risk factor for septic arthritis. So if you are seeing someone in clinic with a history of rheumatoid arthritis, and they are, let's say they're on Humira and methotrexate, and they're doing fine, and they suddenly come in and they have acute knee swelling that's very painful, right, you cannot, do not assume that that's due to the, his RA, right? You need to make sure, think, of, think outside the box and remember that rheumatoid arthritis in and of itself is a risk factor for septic arthritis. So again, the, the treatment of choice in there would be aspiration. I wanna point out the, the, bottom, the bottom bullet below that, uh, that a lot of patients actually don't have any known risk factors for septic arthritis. So again, these are things because it is a can't miss diagnosis, right? You, have a, you need to have a very, very low thr uh, um, threshold of, um, of aspirate in a joint if you're concerned about a septic arthritis. The incidence of septic arthritis is increasing. This is from the UK, but um, I think a similar thing has been found mostly in the States. So it's basically increased by about 50% over the last 15 years. And it's really mostly staff um, is, is the in increasing um, uh, organ pre organ organism prevalence. I think the reason, my, if I had to guess, and I'm not, I don't know what this little blip is from the pneumococcal, but the reason that I think is probably because there's a lot more indwelling lines and catheters and dialysis, right, which staff obviously loves. Um, but, uh, and notably that the incidence of septic arthritis, you'd think it might be increasing a lot in younger patients who are IV drug users, but it's really, um, uh, it's really the older population. So again, these patients who are already at risk or getting lines for dialysis and various other things, Right, those are the, the people that are, that are um, whose incidence of septic arthritis is increasing. The treatment, um, usually empiric treatment is vanc and ceph, although I, I'm not actually sure if um, up to date, I would, I would definitely make sure you talk to ID first. Uh, remember, it's very important to aspirate the joint first before you give antibiotics because, and this has happened before, uh, if you don't, then you're sort of essentially signing on the dotted line to give the patient six weeks or four to six weeks of antibiotics um, if with a negative, um, even if the culture is negative. Very importantly, you have to think of septic arthritis as a closed space infection. So you have to think of it as an abscess. So in addition to antibiotics, they need drainage. Now the majority of time that's gonna be orthopedics doing some kind of washout, but you can also do sort of repeated aspirations. So if you have someone who's like 95 years old and they don't wanna to go to surgery, uh, you can do, and they have like a knee, in, uh, uh, a knee infection, then you can do kind of serial aspirations on that. But again, you have to think of this as 
uh, just antibiotics alone are not sufficient for sort of the treatment of um, septic arthritis. All right, any particular questions about septic arthritis? I don't see any in the chat, um, but if someone has a question, they can just unmute and ask. All right, so let's move on. So this is case three. So we have a 63-year-old female. She has newly diagnosed acute myelogenous leukemia, and she's now coming in with the acute onset of left hip pain. So uh, she's in the hospital, she's developed this, she's afebrile, but when you do, when you roll the hip, right, when you go up and kind of roll the femur and move the femur inside the acetabulum, she has severe pain when she does this. You do an ultrasound and this is the femoral head and femoral neck and this all here is fluid. So essentially she has an acute uh, monoarticular arthritis of the left hip. So you do an aspiration and there's 30, 36,000 white cells with some neutrophils and there's no crystal seen. The gram stain, stain is negative uh, and the cultures are pending. So both the, the synovial fluid and the cultures are pending. So what would be the next appropriate step in this particular case? So you could send some rheumatoid, uh, uh, rheumatology serologies. You check an x-ray of the sacroiliac joints in cases of the spondy. You start antibiotics. You start prednisone, you do an intraarticular injection of depomedrol, or you um, do pain control and just and wait cultures. What do people think? Anybody from VHC have any ideas? We have, we have a vote, one vote for antibiotics and one vote for x-rays on plus five. Okay. Uh, okay. Tell me about the, uh, what's the, uh, what's the, the rationale for the antibiotics? Because she has the uh, AML possible that she's immunosuppressed. So she might, my suspicion for an infection would be higher. Good, but what about the what about the gram stain being negative? It could be so many other things that don't come up on gram stain. First thing that comes to mind is chlamydia, probably not very likely in an elderly woman, but can cause an arthritis. Uh, I'm sure there's other things that aren't coming to mind right now too. Uh, so uh, so good. I like her as that. Just as an, as an aside, um, chlamydia. It seems to be an uncommon cause of a septic arthritis, right? So chlamydia can cause a reactive arthritis. In contrast, gonorrhea, right, which we'll talk about, can cause a true septic arthritis. But I like where your head's at. So yeah, you guys are absolutely right. So again, think about who the patient is, right? So we have an acute monoarticular arthritis in someone who's severely immunosuppressed from the AML. The consequences of missing that diagnosis are catastrophic for her joint. And a gram stain is certainly not 100% sensitive depending on their organism. It's probably pretty good for staff, but remember she's at risk for all kinds of atypical stuff that are probably less commonly seen on the gram stain. So the right answer in this particular case is, a, um, is to start antibiotics empirically while you await, for, uh, while you await the cultures. So again, I think that the teaching point again, remember is that the septic arthritis is destructive. So you know, you're never gonna be faulted for starting antibiotics after you do the aspiration if you have any sort of concern in that particular case. All right, so case number four, uh, we have a 28 year old male presenting with three weeks of migrating arthralgias and fevers. So um, he's had a fever kind of uh, basically every day, um, maybe twice a day, relatively low grade, but like between 38 and 39. And sort of at the time he sort of has pain in the ankle uh, and it's warm, and then that'll last for a day or two, and then it'll bounce over to like the right wrist, and that'll last for a couple days, and then it'll bounce over to the knee, and then the other ankle and stuff. Um, when you do your exam, you see that he has sort of warm joints, but there aren't kind of like dramatically large effusions, but again, he is febrile in this particular case. So let's talk about the differential for this guy. So when I would, if I saw him, right? So again, if I'm thinking about infections, right? I'm thinking about, I, mean, I noticed that there's sort of a migratory component to his, 
connected to his symptoms, which often implies to me kind of immune, immune complex formation. So I would think about, um, so it would be unlikely that this would be like a staph, like a true, like a, a staph um, would like see a joint and then leave the joint and then jump over to a, uh, another joint, for example. But um, something like, you know, a secondary Lyme, right, could do something like this. Um, gonococcal infection could conceivably do something like this. In terms of you know more rheumatic stuff, um, serum sickness could do this, right? So if you had if he had like new exposure to Bactrim or something like that, that could do this. Um, and you know in terms of rheumatology, you know maybe like a, a small vessel vasculitis, like an ANCA associated or even lupus could conceivably do something like this. Again, you're sort of immune. Um, um, but if you look at this guy, this is a real case I had in fellowship. He has a very large sort of tooth abscess here. In that particular case, you notice that he has splinter hemorrhages. So you see these kind of linear red streaks that are occurring in the dermis, like below the, um, uh, below the uh, nail fold. You can see Osler's nodes on him here. So remember, O is, stands for Osler and ouch. So these are kind of painful. In contrast, these sort of Janeway lesions here are not painful. Uh, but these sort of these hyperpigmented lesions on the palms and soles, right? And always in the differential for syphilis, for example. Now, this was a study from France looking at uh, something like a really large percentage of patients with infective endocarditis, something like 500 patients. And they found that about 10% of those patients uh, ended up having some sort of, sort of skin finding associated with infective endocarditis. And in, interestingly, Janeway and Osler's lesions were relatively uncommon, but what was the most common, and this was, I think, about eight, eight to nine percent, was purpura. So this is uh, just an example from that paper of someone who came in with infective endocarditis and had purpura secondary to that. So there are a lot of different skin lesions that you can get in infective endocarditis. But infective endocarditis can present with sort of immune complex formation, actually glomerular, glomerular nephritis, as well as sort of these bouncing around kind of migratory joint uh, migratory joint pains. And this guy ended up, this is actually a real patient I had from fellowship. He ended up having um, group A strep uh, bacteremia. All right, uh, case number five. So we have a 28 year old female. She's come into the ED for fatigue and joint pain for the last week. Um, this is sort of a, a li little bit similar. Um, the She's having knee and ankle and elbow pain. Um, it's very hard to walk because of the pain. It's like there's very warm and swelling that you can pick up on exam. And she's febrile, she's 38.4. So this is what her sort of um, joints look like. Again, in similar to the knee, an elbow effusion is gonna layer kind of more proximally. So how might just on your exam, you do a quick, um, uh, a quick maneuver to help differentiate an olecranon bursitis from a elbow effusion. Any ideas? Because both can kind of present with sort of swelling back there. I think they, they end up looking a little bit different, but how, what could you do on your exam to be confident that you're dealing with an elbow effusion and not an olecranon bursitis? What about two north? I'm not sure I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure actually. Is that David? Can yes. I All right. So um, where is the olecranon bursa? Is that in the joint or out of the joint? It's technically out of the joint, right? Exactly, right? So it's not in the joint. So if you have an olecranon bursitis, your elbow looks swollen but you're able to do this all day long, right? Because again, yeah. the swelling is not inside the joint itself. In contrast, if you have an elbow joint effusion, you're holding it like this, and this is extremely painful. Similarly, you can, sorry, I'm gonna to try to do the camera here, but if you rotate your radial head like this, right, that's gonna be really painful. You can kind of feel that on your elbow when you're doing that there. So that's a good way just on your exam to tell. And then this, the, uh, on the bottom right here, that's someone with an ankle effusion. Now I would argue that it's almost impossible to tell whether someone has a true ankle effusion, meaning fluid in the tibio tailor joint, or if it's just venous stasis based on just looking at it. It's basically impossible. Now, if you have uh, an ankle effusion, again, you doing dorsi and plantar flexion, right, is gonna be very painful. 
But sometimes people with a lot of fluid, like subcutaneous fluid from venous stasis, that can also be painful too. So that's why I'm a big fan of uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound. And if you, any of you guys have worked with me in clinic, this is what we do a lot. Um, but you can see that the, um, basically uh, the ultrasound can help pick up um, the presence of fluid, which can be hard to tell just on your physical exam, especially in the ankle. So you can see where the probe is put here. This is the tibia. This is the talus, right? So the tibia is obviously in the shin. And you can see this black thing here is a tibio-talar effusion. So if you want to aspirate that, you can kind of put your needle in sort of straight like that. You have to avoid the dorsalis pedis artery, um, obviously. In the elbow, right, this is actually, again, the fluid is kind of layering approximately. This is actually the humerus, and there's fluid in here. So again, that's why I kind of like ultrasound. So you do an ultrasound in this particular patient, and she is um, kind of very, uh, um, uh, and she, you see fluid in both these places. So again, let's think about our differential for her. So, uh, you know, again, I think we have to think about, I would definitely leave like endocarditis in the differential. Though again, it would be uncommon to cause like a true effusion, like a large effusion from sort of an immune complex mediated, um, you know, migratory arthralgias. Um, you know, I would think about, uh, again, a, a, a polyarticular septic arthritis would be a consideration in this particular case. Um, so uh, I think definitely doing blood cultures and aspirating would, would, would be very, very important. Um, you know, disseminate gonococcal infection, again, would be on your differential for her. Uh, again, a serum sickness would be on your differential for her. Um, any other ideas, anybody? So let's say, Alice, I, I told you that she was from um, Brazil, and then growing up, she um, had a hard time playing with all the other kids. We had a vote for Chagas disease on plus five. Chagas. Um, uh, I'm not sure if Chagas can give you a true inflammatory arthritis, and I don't think it would present. If it did, I doubt it would present sort of this fulminantly and acutely. But I, I don't really know, honestly. Um, all right, what if you like take a listen, right, and you hear a murmur of mitral stenosis on her. Or, you know, like rheumatoid arthritis from like acute rheumatoid fever in the, in the childhood. Yeah, so not rheumatoid arthritis, but rheumatic fever, no. right? Yeah, sorry. So absolutely. So this is a really good story for rheumatic fever. Again, it's very uncommon for patients born in the US, but you can definitely see it in people who've uh, come from other countries. And uh, it's very important to note that previous episodes of rheumatic fever or rheumatic heart disease increase your risk of subsequent episodes. So uh, the story I was trying to tell you is this woman who has underlying rheumatic heart disease since she was a kid and now has a recurrent episode of rheumatic fever. That's very important to know because anytime you have a, another episode of rheumatic fever that can worsen rheumatic heart disease. So does anybody know what this rash is called? These, sorry, these little dark things are, are artificial. They're, they're like paint or something. Does anybody know what this rash is called? Erythema migrans. Close, this, this, that would be for Lyme. Is it erythema multiforme? Uh, nope, close. It's erythema M. <laughs> So erythema marginatum is the sort of the, the evanescent rash you can get in the setting of rheumatic fever. And these are sort of non protic non-painful things, but they're very, they're evanescent, right? So that means they bounce around from kind of place to place. So again, as Nate was saying, erythema migrans is Lyme, and that has, you have this sort of targetoid kind of lesion. Whereas in erythema marginatum, there's sort of central clearing here. But again, this is, it's important to take a look, right? Because this is, again, it's non protic non-painful, so the patient might not know that they have it. And also it's kind of bouncing around. So if it was in the left arm one day, it might be in the chest or something like that the next day. This is the Jones criteria, which is updated for uh, the diagnosis of rheumatic fever. 
I think the most important thing apart this criteria is the bottom part, right? So you need to show that they had evidence of a recent group A strep infection. And very importantly, right, it's an immune reaction to group A strep. So meaning that the symptoms will start, you know, two to three weeks after the uh, initial infection. So uh, throat cultures, right, are negative 75 to 80% of the time in the setting of uh, group A strep. So that's why you really need these sero serologic testing to kind of make the diagnosis. A lot of people, especially kids, won't actually even remember that they had a throat infection. So again, the absence of a throat infection and the absence of active group A strep um, in the throat is not enough to rule out the diagnosis. You need to, you need to do these um, serologic testing. But again, that's really the most important point to think of is that you have to find, show evidence that they did have a group A strep infection kind of recently. The incidence of um, rheumatic fever has declined dramatically. So this is from, I think, Chicago, but basically looking at really over a 15 year period. Um, and they think it's probably not just because of the use of antibiotics. They actually think that the strain of strep, there's been changes in sort of the underlying strain of strep that makes it sort of less kind of arthritogenic. Um, so it's, again, it's very uncommon for pe people born in the US, but again, much more common and a major cause of valvular heart disease around the world. I think, and I'm, I may be misquoting myself. Travis, are you going into cardiology? No. Um, change to primary care, it's sir. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I think that, as I recall, something like uh, 200,000 people, I think, will die every year of rheumatic heart disease, I think. So it's a very, very common, it's a very, very unfortunate problem um, around the world. All right, so. Uh, case six, so 19-year-old female college student presents with three days of fever and migratory polyarthralgias. So again, she's having, never had any kind of joint pain like this before, but she's also having sort of pain in her, um, in her ankles, in her wrists. Um, she's uh, febrile. Uh, the joints are warm, uh, although you're not sure if you actually see, see any fluid or not. And kind of interestingly, she, when you kind of passively flex and extend her finger, she has a lot of pain when you do that. Then you note here on her exam that you see these kind of uh, purpuric macules and papules on the extremities. So this is a case, as everyone knows, I always give this away when I put a college student, right? Because anytime you know you put a college student down, they're like, oh, it's up to no good. But um, there was a case in the New England Journal um, a couple, maybe a couple years ago of, a, of someone who was in their 50s who came in with a disseminated gonococcal infection. But um, it's uh, relatively uncommon. Again, about 1% of patients with any kind of Neisseria primary infection will have a sort of spread. I think it's very important to know that the initial infection can be asymptomatic, especially in women. So even if they're not having, you know, urethritis, Right, you still have to. If you if this is in your differential, you cannot rule out this in the given the absence of um, sort of primary mucosal infection symptoms. So basically, to make the diagnosis, right, you have to have a compatible clinical presentation and find gonorrhea on them somewhere. Right, so you have to do the urine swab, the throat, you know, anus, basically anywhere um, they could have a primary infection. Um, there are both sort of patient-specific and strain-specific risk, risk factors for um, the ability of any particular gonorrhea infection to disseminate. Um, I want to highlight complement deficiencies. So about 10 to 15 percent of patients who do have disseminated gonococcal infection will have an underlying complement deficiency. Now, I know that hematology, right, and Dr. Broom use a medication called echolizumab a lot, which blocks the formation of the membrane intact complex. So that's very important. Um, in the treatment of certain, of certain complementopathies, right? So like, you know, code gluten in disease and, um, you know, atypical HUS or, or what we call complement mediated thrombotic microangiopathy. So let me give you a, a quiz. So by what percent, or excuse me, by what number do you think that increases your risk of uh, a, a invasive Neisseria infection, that medication? We have a vote for a lot. Okay, uh, it is a lot. Give me, let me see if I can have a number. We have another vote for 150. 150, okay, that's high, good. David, what about you? 
I would say, I don't know, 40 to 50%. 40 to 50 times or 40 to 50%? Higher risk, 40 to 50%, I would say. So like by 1.4 times? Yep. Okay. What about you, Nick? I don't even have a guess. So the answer is actually a thousand. Okay. So if so, you're getting going to put someone on Echolizumab or Solaris, right? You need to make sure that they've been vaccinated as much as you can for any of the Neisseria, any any do any of the Neisseria meningitis infections. Um, unfortunately, the vaccine does not cover all strains, right? So your risk is still increased. Now, again, overall it's still low, but the probably the increased risk is still quite dramatic with um, with Echolizumab. So there's sort of two kind of for, forms that disseminated gonococcal infection can take. One is kind of a more classic on the right here, more of a more classic like septic arthritis. So they come in with a knee effusion. The sort of other form um, with what they call kind of the more bacteremic form will present with sort of more polyarticular disease, tenosynovitis. So when I was talking about how the, pain, the patient had pain when I was moving her finger, um, that was inflammation of the flu of the tendon sheath, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second, as well as dermatitis, so those like purpuric um, lesions and, and fevers. So there's kind of these kind of two phenotypes that people can get can get with a disseminated gonococcal infection. This again is just a shot of some of the of some of the lesions that you that you can see. I could definitely see something like this coming up on your in training or your boards, right? If someone comes in with you know, suggestion of a septic arthritis, they see this here, and the answer is, you know, swab for a gonorrhea or something like that. Again, when I say tenosynovitis, this is what I mean. So this is a tendon, and this is the tendon sheath around it. So if you had like a D. Corvain's tenosynovitis, right? So if you had pain at the first compartment tendons because of overuse, right? So the classic thing, remember, is like the young mother, right, that's picking up their baby. But also we call it texting thumb now, right? Because a lot of people will get it when they're doing their texting. This is what it might look like, right? So you do see some fluid in the tendon sheath. In contrast, if it's part of like disseminated gonococcal infection, this is what it might look like, like something like this or something like this. So kind of a very severe sort of tenosynovitis. Um, again, uh, inflammation in the tendon sheath itself is very characteristic of a disseminated gon gonococcal infection. And again, that's what I was trying to get when I was saying she just had pain when I was passively moving her finger like this, because that was in, um, irritating the flexor tendon, right, that runs up all the way up the hand and inserts into the PIP and DIP here. Now, gonorrhea was very common in the 70s, right, as uh, anybody who's seen like dazed and confused, right, might realize, but it actually is uh, upswinging now recently, and a lot of this is driven by uh, men who have sex with men. Um, the Resistance of gonorrhea is a big problem. So uh, I, 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 I apologize, I don't have the most up-to-date um, kind of um, uh, uh, slide here, but just know that you know they used to do used to treat it with like Cipro and stuff like that, and now it's not anymore. So most people with disseminated gonococcal, well, anybody with disseminated gonococcal infection will need IV antibiotics. And again, the diagnosis is challenging, right? Because you know you can't really test for gonorrhea on a normal uh, you need a special a medium to grow it in, which means you need a special tube to test it in. Because if you swab a throat and someone with gonorrhea and you're using a normal uh, tube and a normal medium, it's going to look like this because we all have a lot of bacteria right in our throat. So it's going to be hard for them to, to identify the presence of gonorrhea there. In contrast, you need to do a swab on a special medium and, and put on this Thayer Martin medium agar, which will inhibit the growth of other things and allow you to see gonorrhea. So again, the point is, is that you have to be thinking about the diagnosis before you test for the cultures, because again, you will need a special tube to send it in. Obviously you can check, check the urine. Uh, 